Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. What, what a great crowd. I'm glad to see all of you out here tonight on this uh, semi-rainy evening. Uh, this, of course, as you already know, is the first event in, in this year's Omnibus Lecture Series. This is our 17th season, and if you do the arithmetic, uh, we will reach our 100th Omnibus Lecture this year, and it will be the last lecture of this season. So it's going to be a special lecture, and I'll talk just a little bit more about that, but Irene Walters has sworn me to secrecy about who's coming, and, uh, and I, I know it'll be somebody that you'll be really excited about, but, uh, but you won't learn about it until about a month before. Well, once again, I want to thank the English Bonner Mitchell Foundation and Jack Lehman for their continued and, and very loyal support to this program. I'll, I'll tell you, all of our speakers have been memorable, but as we come to our 100th lecture, we'd like for you to participate a little bit in, in telling the story of the omnibus lectures. And there's a, uh, a, a website called, or a, a site called omnibuslectures.org, spelled just like omnibuslectures.org. Um, and, and we'd like to know who your favorite speaker was and why. And it'll take you just a couple of minutes. Uh, if you, if you uh, go to omnibuslectures.org, and click on your story, um, you can fill in your own story. So if, if you would do that, we would really appreciate it because it lets us build a very interesting history of the lectures. Um, the, the 100th lecture will be in March. Uh, pardon me, the 100th lecture will be announced in March. And uh, as I said, I, I think Irene threatened me with death or something worse if I told you who it was. So just get excited without knowing who it was. Um, once again, I want to um, thank our media sponsors, Wayne TV, Northeast Indiana Public Radio, and PBS 39 for, uh, for being our, our media outlet to the world. And let me once again remind you of the format pro of the program tonight. I know you've forgotten over the summer, like I always did between eighth and ninth grade. Um, after the lecture, there'll be a limited question and answer period. Uh, there's one microphone on the lower level, one microphone on the upper level. Uh, please keep your questions short so that as many people as can uh, can ask questions. And then at the conclusion of the question and answer session, the governor will be available for a book signing out, out in the lobby. I don't usually do this, but tonight I'm introducing the lecturer. And I'm, I'm very proud to introduce our governor, uh, but it's not, it's not very common for me to be the, the lecturer introducer. And if you know me at all, my introductions are not the long, flowery, let me read you some excerpts from his book, let me tell you about his childhood, those kinds of things. I don't do that. But let me tell you a couple of things that I think are especially important. Um, he came to, to governing from the private sector and actually won the governorship. It's the first election he had been in. Uh, he was at the Hudson Institute and, and Eli Lilly. Uh, he served in Washington, D.C. under uh, Senator Luger and then was an advisor, of course, to Presidents Reagan and Bush. And, and as you know, he was uh, part of the OMB, uh, ran the OMB. But the most important part of the governor's contribution has been that when we look around this country and we look at the number of states in financial trouble, ours is not one of them. And I think that the, the contribution that he's made in terms of the financial stability of this state and the financial health of this state are just incredible. And we owe him a great debt of thanks for that. So. With that, it's my pleasure, my honor, to introduce Governor Mitch Daniels. Well, thank, thank you.
Thank you all very much. Oh, I don't know what occasioned uh, the great good luck and the honor I was just done, but let me just say it as succinctly as, uh, as he does. Uh, there's no one I'd rather be introduced by. Michael Wartell has been a spectacular uh, leader of this uh, institution in a great period of growth. There is no one in Indiana higher ed that I admire more, and I know you're all as grateful for his service as I am. I'm thrilled to be on this campus again, and the, 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 uh, uh, the experience is uh, more uplifting each time I come. There's always something new. I had a great opportunity to meet with uh, some of the leading scholars and students seated down here at, uh, at my 10 o'clock, and um, uh, they remind me uh, of uh, how, what, what great promise there is for this country uh, represented in it and embodied in its young people. Uh, each of them seem to have a very clear idea about their field of study and where they're going. I like the sense of purpose. Daniel's girls didn't always exhibit quite the same <laughs> clear direction. One of our daughters, I recall, initially majored in philosophy and then switched to geography. <laughs> so she knew where she was, but not why. You are a very pre impressive sight. The, uh, uh, Mark, Mark Twain said, uh, he described the perfect audience as informed, inquisitive, intelligent, and drunk. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we're three for four here tonight. <laughs> but I'll leave it to you. Uh, no. Of late, in particular, I mean, this job, quite naturally, whether you do it well or poorly, um, uh, leads you to become um, um, more recognizable. And of late, there have been uh, some reasons and some occasions which uh, seem to have added to all, all to that. And uh, that, that uh, can come in handy uh, on nights like this. Henry Kissinger uh, once said, the best part about becoming better known was when you bore people, they think it's their fault. So if that happens tonight, I'm exonerating you in advance. It won't be your, it won't be your fault. Most, most people, I find, are very, especially in our state, are very, very gracious. I gave some speech in a, a big uh, forum a, a few years ago, and a lovely, rather matronly lady came rushing up the stage afterwards. She said, oh, Mr. Daniel, Mr. Daniel, Governor, that was, that, uh, you know, I just enjoyed that so very much. You were just superfluous. She said, will your remarks be published? And I laughed and said, oh, ma'am, if, if so, probably posthumously. <laughs> she said, I do hope that'll be soon. <laughs> there were a number of legislators here. I saw at a, at a function just beforehand. I appreciate their attendance. I want to thank them for their service. They've done... Uh, individually and collectively great things for Indiana recently. Now, as I freely admit on many occasions, uh, you don't get everything right in public life. You ought to just own up to that. When you, when you misfire, say oops, try to get it right the next time. That even, that I mean, happens to me a lot, even happens to the General Assembly. And some of you will remember that two sessions ago, they passed a rather curious law, well-intentioned, but um, a rather different law that said that you had to be carted at a liquor store regardless of age. Remember? And um, this uh, was judged by our fellow citizens to go, have gone a step or two too far and was repealed in the last session. But before it was, it led to some humorous encounters. I was in a convenience store down south, and I was standing behind a fellow probably in his 80s, um, and he had a six-pack in his hand, and the uh, young lady at the counter, just doing her job, said, good afternoon, sir. Got any ID? 
He said, about what? So, of course, that is the question that confronts uh, every speaker and and maybe on your mind uh, uh, tonight about the remarks I'm about to give. About what? I'll tell you about what. They're about what's been on my mind now for quite some time. I hope has been on yours. I hope um, will uh, be on the minds of all our fellow citizens uh, intensely these uh, next few years in America. If what I'm about to say strikes you as hyperbolic or um, uh, missing on, on some critical fact, then please stick around later and straighten me out because I'd love to be convinced that I'm wrong about this. But my uh, view and what I think the arithmetic of our times tells me is that we face a survival level threat to the America we've known, uh, to its economy, to that, but beyond that, the things that are even larger than our standard of living to the what we have called the American dream to that very special sense of optimism that uh, Americans may take for granted but should not it's been widely observed that in most cultures through time and even today the golden age is identified is located in the past somewhere but in America the golden age has always been out in front of us even in hard times, and we've had plenty. Americans have never doubted that we'd make tomorrow better than today, that our children would live better than we would. And animated by that spirit, this nation has done things that are the envy of the world. And I believe that that spirit and the progress that always comes from it is also at risk. Our world leadership is at risk. If we don't begin to address the crushing debt burden that we already have and that we are scheduled to multiply in the years not very far ahead of us now, we will again uh, do injury beyond that to our standard of living and our expectations for the future. Pretty much an iron law of history that no one follows a pauper. And we are on our way to being the most indebted nation in history. That would be a very bad thing for us and a bad thing for a world which has benefited immensely from the American century that was the 20th and from our leadership against various successive forms of tyranny. Not very long ago, it's striking to think this, uh, uh, one of our wisest uh, uh, scholars and writers was declaring the end of history uh, among many other people. He saw that the principles of freedom, the free institutions uh, of which America is largely responsible in this world, had, had ended the argument with the collapse of communism and the fall of the wall. Freedom was everywhere. Free political institutions, free economic institutions had so proven their superiority that everyone would copy them and it looked like that for a little while and yet a few years later it doesn't look like that at all and a very strong and uh, uh, long-lived school of thought is being heard very uh, audibly and loudly once again our one of our great living citizens today is a fellow named Erskine Bowles and um, he was, among many other services to our country, he was the Democratic co-chair of the recent Deficit and Debt Commission that you've probably heard about, the Bowles Simpson Commission. And he's made an interesting uh, and, and useful observation. He says, we are facing the most predictable crisis ever. And what he means is, if you just do the math and look at the uh, not just at the debts of today, but those that are uh, heading toward us, that they will inevitably lead to serious crisis, to economic breakdown, to the probable stunting permanently of growth as the mortgage payment, so to speak, 
becomes larger and larger and claims dollars that are not there for investment that hires people, aren't even there for other public expenditures that we think are important. And he was exactly right, of course. But as I contend in this uh, little effort that, I did, that we, was just published last week, this crisis was really predictable in a larger sense. There is a long lineage of thinkers and scoffers and, as I call them, the skeptic, who have always said this cute idea of government of and by the people will never work for long. 220-odd years of America is not very long historically. And I, I, I suggested that I don't know, no one knows when the first Greek coined the term democracy, but it couldn't have been a week before somebody said, well, that'll never work. And uh, there are certainly people on this campus who could do a far better job than I tried to do of enumerating examples of these uh, sorts of thoughts, but they run from Plato to Voltaire to Rousseau, actually, to Nietzsche and many, many others, who said, one way or another, governments, self-government will run on the rocks. Prominent theory uh, is that such governments, as politicians, cater to the people, pander to the people, as we say more in our time, will spend themselves broke. And that a majority of the people will discover with th th through their votes they can expropriate the property of the others and they'll break the society's economic engine that way. There are other concerns. Our founders were profoundly concerned, alarmed, that this government they'd given birth to would prove fragile and ephemeral. So I chose for the title of this book, Keeping the Republic. And people in this audience know exactly where I plagiarized that notion. Ben Franklin exiting Independence Hall after the last debate had finally ended about the composition of our Constitution. Reportedly, uh, got a question from the crowd, Mr. Franklin, what kind of government have you given us? And history records he replied, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. From the very day of self-government's birth in this country, those who had fought and risked all life, liberty, their sacred honor, to conceive liberty, fretted that it might not last. Adams and Madison, they all wrote about it endlessly. Their concern tended to be that the character traits that gave rise to freedom and free institutions, a stubborn insistence on personal autonomy, uh, an insistence on liberty over security, personal responsibility, commitment to self-improvement, that these characteristics would atrophy, would wither. They worried about it to their dying day. Lincoln, in those immortal words, evoked the mystic chords of memory stretching from his day, which wasn't, which was just one lifetime after all from the founding, and worried that already the chords of memory from present day to patriot's grave would, would wither away, would no longer be heard by those who needed to be reminded. Now, I found a, in researching uh, this subject an interesting little nugget that I hadn't known before. On the original coinage of our country, the, some of the very first metal money we made was an interesting, uh, rather curious to me, Latin inscription. I'm going to mangle the pronunciation, I'm sure. 
exitus in dubio est. The outcome is in doubt. Don't you think that's a rather interesting expression for a, a government that has just come into being through a, a, an act of historic importance, a, a successful revolution against tyranny? But at, from the first moment, the outcome is still in doubt. And now today, as a symptom, many would say, and I think they're right, of some fraying, some withering, some atrophy of our commitment to free institutions and to being the kind of citizens who maintain them, we've got some problems. I, I have described them, uh, maybe too glibly, as the new red menace. We once confronted the red menace of the Soviet Union with its nuclear weapons and the incredible danger it represented to us all. Now it's red ink. But to me, in some ways, at least as serious. Oh, it's not as terrifying. We won't, it won't kill us if things go wrong. But the chances of that happening were always very, very small. In this case, the risk is near certain if we, if we don't change direction. The debts cannot be wished away. They're not going to solve themselves and they will do certain terrible damage, as I mentioned earlier, to everything we hold dear. They are, they are not like, the, here's where the analogy breaks down. We cannot deter them through some strong-willed actions of our own. We can't negotiate with them any more than you could a great white or an iceberg. So, the challenge of our time is to see that the skept that is to disprove the skeptics and to prove to those to whom we owe this great country of ours that we are the exception to history's rule. As we grapple with this rather tangible and in some ways mundane problem of money and budgets and spending and the provisions of, of, of uh, statutes about uh, social programs and so forth. I believe we're really addressing questions that are even larger, as if those don't seem big enough. We're really going to have to ask ourselves as Americans questions like, who's in charge here? Is government, is public service, as some of us were raised to believe, that which people of goodwill, which citizens do, avidly and, and, and happily, to enable the flourishing of the important realms of life, those being the private realms of business and enterprise, of voluntary associations, of nonprofit organizations, setting right boundaries creating the conditions for growth and opportunity, or, as many people sincerely believe, and I, I attest to their, I'm, I'm willing to stipulate to their sincerity at, uh, on every page of the book that I wrote, that, uh, no, life has just become too complicated. It is too complex. Americans in modern times are victims in a sea of predators we need our benevolent betters to look out after us, lest through our gullibility or just incompetence, we make unfortunate decisions. We choose the wrong credit card. We take out the wrong mortgage. We couldn't possibly pick our own health insurance. Someone else better decide on the health care choices we make whoever's paying for them. Oh my gosh, we might buy the wrong light bulb. And that then leads to a closely related question, which all of us, I hope, will think about hard. We answer those more mundane questions of policy. 
what kind of people do we choose to be? What kind of people are we? Creatures of dignity or objects of therapy? The sphere of individual autonomy in the United States, it seems to me, has been shrunk and shrunk, but so gradually and, and, uh, and steadily that maybe we haven't noticed the frog doesn't know the water's boiling. We can be desensitized to more and more of our range of choice being whittled away. We had four girls, and um, I always say that when the, when the first one caught a cold, we rushed her to the doctor. When the fourth one swallowed a quarter, I took it out of her allowance. As we, as we confront, and we will confront these problems, they are coming on in a way that cannot be ducked, even by a political class that loves to procrastinate and loves to, to uh, wait till the last minute before taking bold action. I hope that both sides of our national argument will think a little harder about the quality of the people that, for whom they work in public service. It's my belief that neither side of our national debates has given Americans enough credit. As I said, one starts with the assumption that Americans really can't cut it in this world, that they have to be um, uh, treated as, uh, as, ch as children virtually and looked after by those who have their best interest at heart and, and have, the comp have the special competence and expertise to uh, protect them from their own mistakes. An example that some folks haven't thought about here, and it comes from our uh, social security system. There's a term in the literature, the noble lie, uh, actually used or, or coined by strong proponents and early shapers of the system. And the noble lie was uh, uh, the, uh, was a presentation uh, to Americans that led them to believe that they were putting the money away for themselves when they never were. As you know, from its beginning, it's been a pay-as-you-go system, which today's workers pay for today's retirees. Nothing wrong with that, by the way, but most Americans didn't, didn't understand it that way, and nobody told them differently. Why? Well, the supposedly noble part was that if people really understood the deal, that uh, it might not uh, have political support over time. Purely political manipulation. It was always deemed essential to give a check to everybody, no matter how wealthy. And on the surface, that makes no sense at all. Why should billionaires be sent pension checks that are really there to try to help people of modest means avoid destitution in their later years? Well, once again, the argument was purely political. If we don't cut everybody in the deal, he won't have enough political support someday. Well, setting aside the fact that we can no longer afford to do that, think what it says about the American people provably the most generous, compassionate people on earth. We give away money, we volunteer time like nobody on the planet. I don't believe for a moment that when, and I think it is when, we begin to concentrate the finite resources of Social Security on those who really need them most, when we stop sending Warren Buffett a check every month, that it'll lose support with the American people. I don't believe that. I think it sells them short. Now, meanwhile, on the other side of the argument, people with whom I suppose I agree more often than not, I think also lapse into an unfortunate and dangerous low regard for the American people. They are too, they're very quick to talk about what a high percentage are getting uh, some kind of uh, largesse from their fellow citizens, that is, a check from the government. 
how, how a dwindling percentage are paying any taxes or any meaningful taxes at all, and how commitments to family and other important cultural norms that have always undergirded a free society are uh, shrinking or collapsing. That's all true, but it's a very, very a big mistake, I think, to assume that Americans are not still a people born to liberty and a people capable of and determined to lead their own lives and lead them responsibly. Another mistake that I think many allies of mine make, and I caution them against, is to allow skepticism about big government, which is as healthy as the Coney dog. I mean, as American as the Coney dog. It's a very second time today I've made that mistake. It's a healthy instinct and very American. But not when skepticism about big government morphs into contempt for all government. Because it is, you can believe in a large or a limited government, but particularly in times of emergency like this, it is effective government that we need to make the changes that will lead us out of the dangerous corner we've painted ourselves into. I'll tell you a little piece of data that just floated by me just a week ago. No one in Indiana knows this yet, as far as I know. But I was speaking to a prestigious institute in New York. They showed me they had just finished a national survey, a, a renowned, renowned pollster. He was President Clinton's uh, advisor. I took it across the country in, if not every state, then a big cross-section of states. And one of the questions was, do you believe your state government is effective, acting effectively in your interest? The number one state for confidence in state government was Indiana at 77 percent. And that thrilled me, not because it seemed like a good report card, but be because it seems to indicate that Hoosiers do have some confidence that the people working for them really are trying to pursue the best interest of all and are somewhat capable at doing it. And what's important about that is if you have lots of other problems to tackle, and obviously we do, I, there are folks who believe that are more likely to support the next change and the next reform and the next attempt to move forward. And we need that nationally. Now, um, in the book I wrote, I start by explaining things that it's not. For instance, it's not autobiographical. My life is far too boring for that. I wouldn't write it. You wouldn't read it. But I also say I'm, I'm not into writing autobiographies. I'm not into writing obituaries either. As huge as our problems are, as many zeros as are attached, as dramatic as the necessary changes will have to be, I am optimistic about Americans' ability to tackle them and to confound the skeptics. I've got two reasons. One is that just as a simple operating, an operating principle of life, I've, I've never understood any other approach than confidence and optimism. There's an old coach's cliche, if you think you can or think you can't, you're right. So starting from a, a standpoint that is positive and, and assumes the very best about Americans, about their concern for each other, about their willingness to look at the facts openly and honestly, understand them for what they are, for what they mean about the changes we, ma we must undertake, and then to support a bold program that is in the broad national interest, I choose to believe it. I think we have some grounds from our experience in Indiana these last few years to assert that. I was careful not to talk too much about Indiana. I didn't really want to use too many examples at all. The, 
those who read the manuscript and the publishers asked for more and I gave them a little more I, I said it to them I said listen telling people about what happened in your state telling people from somewhere else is like showing them your home movies they may pretend to be interested but they're really not but there are a few things that I think have some I hope have some meaning or implication for our bigger national problems and one of them is that Hoosiers have shown over and over again that uh, you can speak honestly about a mismatch between wants and means you, you can say that we cannot we, as much as we'd like we can't do everything for everyone all at the same time and do right by everybody we have understood that to say we can't afford it right now is not the same as saying that's a lousy idea or that project is not worthwhile I love Hoosiers and I think there's we have a lot of great qualities but I don't assert that we're any better maybe all that different from our fellow Americans so I believe our fellow Americans can be spoken with in, in much the same way I also derive optimism from the fact that it will become obvious, if it hasn't yet, that we are all in this together. If we don't address this problem, it will do things far worse than, as I, as I indicated, than simply blight our standard of living, consume resources we'd like to commit to education or to other worthy purposes. And, it, and every one of us is in that boat. As usual, the young and the poor will suffer the worst, but absolutely every American will regret it and regret we didn't do something more about it. So therefore, it is an opportunity to unite. I have said, and some chose to, or some misunderstood, or some chose to misunderstand, that I thought we ought to have a truce on other questions about which we are honestly and sometimes strongly divided things we refer to as the social issues but not just that race and gender and these other questions that in a relative sense are not the threat to America and every Americans that our fiscal emergency is people who disagree about other things are going to have to come together. We have, we have learned in Indiana these last few years over and over, big change requires big majorities. And by definition, that, will, that means coming together of people who don't agree on everything, but agree on the big things or one big common objective. The Brits have a, a great saying now that the money has run out we shall have to begin to think <laughs> I won't wear you out here the questions might take us to some of the some of the uh, suggestions I've made about my best cut at what it is we'll need to do the changes we'll need to make to restore vitality to our economy, promise to our future, demonstrate once again that free people can govern themselves successfully. In very brief terms, we will have to save the safety net. We, will, we, ought to, we can preserve it just as is for those now involved in the programs and those who are going to come into them in the next few years, but we will have to create a Social Security 2.0 and a Medicare 2.0 starting out there in a few years for the younger people uh, so that they can have some a degree of protection and peace of mind in their later years also. We're going to have to make big, big changes in the uh, rest of the federal government and nothing can be off limits including national defense which is the first duty of government can be no compromise with it but we're going to have to re-examine whether we need to maintain every mission everywhere to the same extent that we have in the in the really glorious 
past period in which America brought and protected freedom around, around the world. We're going to have to go to general quarters for growth of the private economy. And we've been headed, I re regret to say, just the wrong direction there now that for the last few years. But that will mean, in some ways, this may be harder than the so-called third rail issues I just mentioned. That may mean, would mean, that other important goals at least take a pause. We should, in the interest of our future, to have a chance of putting America back to work, of having the young people of America who are unemployed in unprecedented numbers these days, have a, a chance to start up life's ladder and to have a chance of gathering the revenues we need to pay our bills and to maintain the services of government that are truly important. We're going to need rousing growth in this economy. There's no other way to get it. There's no, there's no way you can jimmy the tax rates in the mishmash tax code of today. The great Bill Simon once said, it would be great if America had a tax code that looked like someone designed it on purpose. And that is one of the steps we need to take, is a tax code that has the purpose of, of generating more investment and growth, and therefore revenues, in a thriving private sector. So I'm happy to lay out in that book, I'm happy to lay out tonight if anyone's interested, what I think the best way forward would be, but here's, here's the point. As far as I'm concerned, having told you my best ideas and argued for them as passionately and, success and, as, and as persuasively as I can, if uh, we can't get agreement on that, then let me hear, you know, let's, let me hear yours. Let's find out what, you know, if we can't do the best thing as I might see it or you might see it, we better do the second best, or the third best, or the fourth best set of things, as opposed to inaction and drifting over a fiscal and financial Niagara. And I have said elsewhere, speaking only for myself, I feel strongly about things. I'll be glad to tell you what I think will work. But I have no interest in standing in the wreckage of our republic saying, I told you so, or you should have done it my way. I think we're going to need to appeal to, even demand, of our national leadership on both sides. A mentality a little more like that. I think we ought to try to call them to accounts when they substitute rancor for constructive suggestions. We need more candor and less rancor in our national debate. There's a chapter in the book about this. A commitment to results, I have learned, and I had to learn it sometimes the hard way, a real commitment to results in public life that leads you to learn to bite your tongue, even suffer insults, correct misstatements and factual falsehoods, but don't get drawn into soldier old man arguments that feel really good for about 10 seconds until you realize that folks out there may have tuned out your, your own point of view because they think you're only interested in the, in the tit for tat. I hope that we will, whatever choices we make, we will opt or certainly lean to those that entrust Americans and try to empower Americans to believe again believe, and, 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 and that Americans are capable. Oh, sure, folks will make mistakes. Sure, not everyone will make the wisest choices, but we ought to make that possible for them because a society that, makes, that starts from the other uh, conviction uh, ultimately uh, both is more likely to fail and demeans the very people that uh, it purports to serve. This is going to be a great endeavor. It can be seen as a terrifying and daunting proposition, sure, that's so. But when, and I say when, not if, we have made the necessary adjustments, 
we have reconciled ends and means, wants and resources, when we have reestablished the primacy of the private sector, and private life, and private enterprise and growth as the heart of the country, with government there as the boundary setter and the, and the enabler, will have done something even more glorious than ensuring a better life for our kids, than ensuring America's economic leadership and therefore world leadership in a world that desperately needs it. We will have shown the skeptics they were wrong. We will have revalidated to a suddenly doubting world the principles of freedom for which uh, America has always stood and for which we hope all people everywhere uh, will uh, one day share. I say to folks all the time, um, not that naive, not blind to our problems, but if we are going to summon the best from the American people, we must start by assuming the best. I do. I've met so many of them. I've stayed in 113 homes in this state. And I know that exodus in dubio est, but I also know that the skeptics of history have never met the American people. Thank you so very much. I'm looking for a mic. There's one. And, and I'm listening for a question. The question is, well, that's a twofold question, as they say. What The question was, what's the future hold for yours truly and the state of Indiana. Answer to part A, professor, is I don't have a clue. I really don't. And I don't want it to, and the, and the audience uh, has no reason to be particularly interested, really. Uh, the answer to question two is I think there are great things ahead for this state. Um, we have, uh, I believe it's fair to say, come a long way in many respects. We certainly are uh, seen everywhere now as one of the very top tier states for economic activity, for investment, for growth, for jobs. Every such rating has us there. Huge difference from a few years ago. It's been very frustrating, the, the national recession, which brought everything to a screeching halt. Just as we had arrived at that position, I told everybody, you know, it was like being the prettiest girl in school and they called off the prom. And we, de and we need, as, as every state needs, that pro-growth, full-throated, nothing else is as important, commitment to private sector growth in order that the music plays and we can start dating again. But uh, I, I hope that day will come. Um, so I, I'm very, very hopeful about the future of this state. We've got a long way to go, of course, and better people than I will will have to carry it forward. But uh, um, I, as in other things, I choose to be optimistic. How about that mic there? We have a question for you over here. My name is Sonia Cordes, and I have a question concerning the nursing department. Um, in 2009, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was signed into law by President Obama, and then followed by the Health Care and Education Reconciliation Act of 2010. What do you think the impact of these legislations will have on nursing education and other health professional education? Well, thank you. Um, 
Well, let me just say uh, that I, I think that the uh, Health Care Act, the Federal Health Care Act, um, was ill-advised in the extreme. And um, I frankly am hopeful that we'll have a second go at that one as a country, either that uh, Congress, uh, sort of like the uh, card carding the octogenarian bill here, that the Congress will think a bit harder about it and rewrite it, or that uh, maybe the, the courts will step in as they might and say that it was uh, an overreach constitutionally. And in terms of nursing education and the, and the rest, I mean, I think uh, I'm a huge proponent of nursing. I met some nursing students uh, already on this campus, and uh, there, there's no issue there. We're going to need a lot of nurses. Demographically, we're going to need a lot of uh, of uh, talented healthcare professionals. It's a very promising career for anybody, and uh, uh, we've stressed it here in Indiana, but uh, it'll do well under any scenario. But the, the bill you're asking about is going to be, I think, was a very wrong turn nationally. You know, I wrote about it in the book not because anybody needed to say any more about the, the bill. I came at it slightly differently. I, I had written a chapter about the debt, followed by a chapter about who's in charge, the growing domination of private life by the public sector, and then a chapter called The Shrunken Citizen about the, 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 the diminution of personal autonomy and, and, uh, and, and citizenship in the original sense. And the next, I, then I chose to write a little bit about the uh, Obamacare, as they say, bill, um, not as health care policy so much, but because it, it is the confluence of all those three threads that were troubling me. It's going to make the debt much worse. It was advertised otherwise, but it will. It's a huge expansion of the power of the federal government over uh, what had been, uh, what is the largest sector of, uh, uh, of the uh, private economy. And it will diminish the decision-making power of uh, of, of citizens. So that's why I thought it was very useful, I thought it was very uh, appropriate, I mean, that it, that it got all the debate and attention it did, and I hope that debate's not over. Get yeah, back there. Governor Daniels, we have a question over here. Thank you. There has been much debate about government regulation hindering corporations' effort to create jobs. What do you say to people who believe that corporations are more concerned about pleasing stockholders than helping workers prosper? Well, I say that uh, if they don't please stockholders, that is, if they don't succeed, uh, workers won't prosper. And here's, a little, here's a basic rule of life. No profits, no jobs. Uh, incidentally, no profits, no non-profits. When people come to me, as they frequently do, um, from businesses, um, and um, want to talk about some issue that's on their mind, almost always on their way out the door, they'll say the same, some version of the same thing. They'll say, well, thanks for your time. Is there, is there anything we can do, anything our business can do for Indiana? I always tell them the same thing. Make money. I want you to go make money. I want you to be good at what you do and succeed. I want you to make something that some free customer will part gladly with their dollar for because they think it's valuable. And if you do that, Sooner or later, you're going to hire some more people, which is what we really care about. You're going to pay them well. And um, you're going to have some money left over to support all the good causes that we Americans love to, to support. So it is a very false, I think, and an unfortunate uh, uh, view to suggest that somehow the interests of businesses, which are nothing more than communities of people organized for some purpose, um, uh, organized to try to succeed in, in our economy, that somehow these are adverse. You'd ask about regulation. Um, both sides here could stand a little improvement too. Regulation, has, it properly done, has, uh, has led to great improvements. Take the environment. Almost no high school kid I meet in Indiana knows this until I tell them. The air that we are breathing at this moment, the water outside is dramatically cleaner than it was when I was in school, or you were in school, or even my daughters were in school. So-called conservatives should 
pause once in a while and notice and even celebrate that. But of course the proponents of regulation don't want to either because if they admitted that we made a lot of progress, then somebody might question whether we, whether it really makes sense to do a lot more of it if it is expensive, makes it expensive to hire people. So I really believe that we, uh, if, you, if you place the interest of workers first, and particularly those who aren't working at all right now, uh, you would uh, it would lead you to want to do a whole lot less of the regulating that makes it ex expensive to put those people back on the job. Over here. Uh, Governor Daniels, I'm looking forward to reading your book. Um, my favorite uh, Republican advisor to presidents is uh, Kevin Phillips. And in his book, Wealth and Democracy, he makes a very different um, analysis regarding the threat to the republic. And that is, it's inequality, uh, concentrations of wealth, uh, increases in levels of poverty, out-migration of capital. Since you have advised presidents who have actually done more to increase inequality, uh, past forms of regressive taxation, uh, increasing levels of poverty, I'm curious as to what you think of Kevin Phillips' analysis in contrast to yours. Well, not much. And I don't think much... <laughs> I know. <laughs> and, and with all respect, Professor, you just stacked up three completely false assumptions as a premise for your question, you know. Um, no, I mean, uh, let me tell you an irony for people uh, who see the world as you do right now. Those who want to perpetuate the current set of policies, and in particular, uh, for instance, uh, try to address our fiscal problems by raising tax rates. I mean, I said earlier, we're going to need a lot more revenue. The question is practical one. How do you get it? Um, you know, have a huge vested interest in inequality. Right now, we have the most progressive tax system in the OECD. 26 countries in the developed world wealthy people in America pay a higher percentage relative to their income than in any of the others. Now, you can say well, it's still not enough. Let's have some more. Honest people can differ. We ought to start with the facts. And the, uh, at this stage, to try to wring more money, you know, the top 3% pay more than the other night, the lower 97% right now in taxation. To, to try to wring more money out of this, you have to have more income inequality. You need rich people to get a lot richer, which I don't think is what any of us aspire to. Now, I won't accept your characterization. I have, I have said, uh, certainly not for myself, I have always said to the people who serve in our administration, it is not our job to see that uh, successful people of means make any more money. It's our job to see with, that people with nothing have a better chance to make some. And that'll remain our policy till the last day of our administration. Thank you. Gov I'm sorry, Gov the, they want me to use the microphone, folks. Yeah. Governor Daniels, you made reference earlier to the Erskine Bowles Commission, which seemed to be the perfect opportunity for our national leaders to embrace some of the things that you're talking about. It was bipartisan intelligent, learned people. Why do you feel, or do you have an idea why there was so much resistance to accepting their proposals, and what do you think our national leaders can do to get beyond the serious partisanship that seems to be such a barrier? Right, thank you. Uh, well, I agree with you that they made a very useful uh, uh, contribution. Um, uh, I said at the time, when people asked me, I said, you know, there's some, there are a lot of things in there that I disagree with strongly. Thank goodness. Meaning that uh, if they had produced a report that anybody agreed with entirely, uh, it might not have had much chance of moving forward. Well, it didn't go anywhere yet. Uh, quite honestly, the first reason was the president who commissioned them, which I thought was a good move, totally ignored their conclusions, which I thought was a sad thing. And so when, he, when the president wouldn't have anything to do with them, nobody else ventured out to do so either. But Consistent with my uh, determination to be optimistic, I will say that I thought it was another step forward. I, I am very impatient, and I hope you are too, about getting started on 
on the uh, path uh, toward solvency. It's going to take years and years and years. There's so much debt. By the way, I've been talking about the federal debt, but that's, it's not fair to put this all at the federal government's door. The state and local governments have, ma have amassed huge amounts, too. We've paid Indiana's debt down 40% in the last seven years, but nationally it went up 40%, the other 49 states. It's a huge overhang. And private debt will also have to be worked out, as they say, deleveraged before we can have the kind of a economic uh, uh, vitality we want. Um, but I hear a clock ticking, and I don't predict it. Um, I, I don't think it's prob uh, uh, I don't think it's likely, but you cannot exclude that a crisis could come very quickly. You know, Greece, the cradle of democracy, is for sure going over the falls. They've been, they've been buying time, but they have, you know, there, there is no way out mathematically for them. But they're only a certain distance closer to, the, to Niagara than we are, statistically. And in this world of flash crashes and trillions moving at the speed of light every minute, um, it isn't, the, the, percent, the probability is not zero that we don't have much time at all, that there could be a big move against the dollar. I write a little scenario, nightmare scenario in the book that I trust will never occur, but could. And so I am taking optimism, however, from the fact that we're talking about the right subjects now. It's a huge difference from when I outlined the book 20-some months ago. It's, we haven't done very much, but we're on the right topic, and there's been a Bull Simpson Commission. And... Um, Congress has begun at least to, you're, they're talking about subjects you couldn't touch even two years ago, like Social Security. I just hope we move fast enough, and what will it take? I hope it doesn't take a cataclysm. I hope what it takes is a, that quadrennial opportunity that comes next year in which at least one side levels with the American people, explains exactly how big the difficulty is, and uh, offers up specific answers, trusts the American people, as we have tried to trust Hoosiers, to handle the facts and to authorize the kind of changes that would, that would matter. Over here. Hello, Governor. Thanks a lot for being here. I enjoyed your talk. Um, I grew up in a very pro-choice household. That was one of the most important political issues in my family growing up. So I was very happy to hear a little over a year ago how you wanted to have a truce on social issues, probably the most hot button of those, of course, the abortion issue. But then I was surprised and very, very disappointed uh, to hear that your administration got behind the move to withdraw funding from Planned Parenthood via the Medicaid uh, uh, funding. Mm -hmm. What would you say to people like me that your actions are consistent, but rather than being that you're going to say one thing but do another? Yeah, fair question. How will you convince someone like me that your actions haven't been hypocritical? Well, it's a fair question, and there's a very straight answer. Uh, what I said, I said, by the way, openly as someone who supports the right to life, and, I, and it drew its criticism from people who also strongly do, uh, was very specifically spoken in the federal context. The point was, we have a national emergency, the one I've been talking about for 50 minutes. We have a national emergency here, and in such an emergency, we ought to set aside our, our honest differences on these other questions, including the, the, the one that you're, that you're uh, uh, passionate about. Indiana doesn't have a fiscal emergency. We have a better credit rating than the federal government. And therefore, I was never talking about a situation like that. All kinds of issues that I don't think the federal government should be using its precious time on right now were fair game in Indiana, and I want to say a word about the specific bill you brought up. I didn't make that suggestion. Um, the uh, the uh, not denial of funds to Planned Parenthood was bolted on, amended on, very late in the day, to another bill which I did support. Before I si so, so I signed it, never advocated it or worked for it, but I signed it. 
But before I did, I did two things. First, I checked to see, will any patient, will any single woman in Indiana lose any service? The answer was no, not, no, not at all. There are 800, happened to be 800 exactly, other service providers. Every county had, in most cases, dozens. Not one patient, of course, the, the court reversed the uh, bill later, but I knew when I signed it, not one patient would miss one appointment or one prescription or one piece of service because of it. And the second thing we did was, before, I, before it became law, we notified, went to great length and expense to notify every Medicaid recipient of who those 800 servers were. So not a one of them would even have to cast about to see where the service was. So, um, per very good question. Thank you for asking. I hope I've answered it adequately. So. Well, can I just ask a, a quick follow-up to that? So if I understand correctly, the only way we can have a truce on social issues is if the economy is bad. And if it's good in Indiana, then there's no truce. But if it's bad federally, then there is a truce? Well, no. Let me say it again. We have a fiscal emergency. Government has, in Washington, is spending money. You are going to be a victim of this. You should be as interested in this as anybody in the room because your future is very much at risk tonight. Your, your chances of a job, your chances of a job that supports a family, your chances of not bearing an, a crushing tax burden are all in uh, grave uh, doubt this evening. In that situation, I was saying that the people responsible at that level ought to come together and work on that, and that people who disagreed as, as, as honest people can about questions like this one, like uh, right to life, um, ought to possibly set that aside for a while. That's all I had to say. And, uh, you know, if folks don't agree, it's okay, I get it. Uh, but I am, I'm just, it was just really a matter of setting, stating the priority. Here in Indiana, completely different situation. Never, ever made such a suggestion and didn't see the need for one. In fact, there. I'm Fred Gilbert. <clears throat> I uh, noticed in your book you want to trust Americans. The first word of our Constitution is we. One of the problems that I see with current federal issues is change we can believe in means everybody including Republicans and Democrats. One of those other things that I learned in 33 years working for the state of Indiana was that we had a team. I noticed in your book you, you put FSSA in three pages calling it an oops. I dedicated my life to that program and to the people that I served and I do believe I did it well. The two years after privatization were the worst two and a half years I spent in that entire system. Now, my question to you, sir, in the spirit of we, will you offer and open up your suggestions and ask the former workers and current workers of the state of Indiana, including the contractor workers who have been excluded from this discussion, how you can make it better, especially considering the fact that you've not rolled out yet the biggest county in the state. Well, <clears throat> let's see. Um, when I arrived in office, uh, waiting uh, on my desk was a letter from the federal government that said, this is a, a quick paraphrase, but it said very clearly, uh, you got to do something soon or we're going to sanction Indiana heavily. You've got the worst welfare system in the country. Um, and we did. It was failing by every measure. It was, uh, it was late making decisions. It was making huge errors on both sides. People who were uh, entitled to benefits weren't getting them. People who weren't entitled to benefits were getting them. We had more uh, food stamp recipients per capita than anybody in the country. We had more than states two and three times our size. And uh, so we felt we had an obligation and, frankly, an order to fix it. We did a year and a half of study, reached some conclusions about what would be the most effective and taxpayer-friendly way to fix it, and gave it a try. Didn't work. You're quite right about that. But it, you should know that we are now winning awards, and we got bonuses from the federal government. You're right. There's one 
county yet to go, but the rest of the state is in a new hybrid system. And we did ask, in fact, exhaustively asked. The new hybrid system took the best of the old, the best of the new, and uh, is performing well, um, better than most states. We're now better than the national averages. Indiana's never been there before. We're not as good as we ought to be. We'll continue to take input always from those in the, um, in the trenches. I've visited a lot of offices myself. And uh, I was in, in an office in Spencer not too long ago, sitting with those who were meeting face to face with our, uh, or working on the phones with our, um, with benefit recipients. So, uh, you know, I, I cite this in the book as a, an example of a, something larger, and which is that we have believed uh, from the beginning, said very openly to our fellow citizens, ours was going to be a very active administration. We may believe in a limited sphere for government. But within that sphere, we believe government has an obligation to be excellent. And uh, whether it's at the license branch, or when you file your tax return, or when you visit a state park, or if you have to, if you're a part of the uh, welfare or income support systems. And we take that very seriously. We measure everything so we know if we're getting better or not. And you should know tonight that if you're in that 77% that gave state government a good grade for effectiveness, you're on pretty firm ground. And I can prove it to you because, again, we, we, uh, we keep score. And we reward people who do a good job. This is revolutionary, you should understand. We got, re well, in government, it's revolutionary. <laughs> In the old system, in which this gentleman, thank you, by the way, for your question and your service to us all, but the system in which he spent the vast majority of those years, if he did the very best job in his department, he was treated no differently than the person with, a, with his feet up reading the sports section. Not true. It is true, sir. Everybody got exactly the same raise uh, every year regardless. And we changed that to a system people in the auditorium would probably be more familiar with. Those who have done the best work, some of them have gotten year-on-year double-digit increases, biggest raises in the history of state government. Those who are not pulling their weight do not get a raise and get a second chance, but uh, if they don't meet expectations, are asked to step aside for somebody who will. We are very, very... Uh, committed to getting these things right, especially in the area that he mentions. And, um, I, again, when you're, when you're active on every front, you can, against every problem you can identify, you're not going to shoot all bullseyes. And when we don't, we just try to own up to it and quickly learn from our mistakes and do better the second time. Over here. Thank you, Governor D Daniels, for uh, coming here tonight. Thank you for talking. Sure. Uh, as we saw in the news recently, Herman Cain pulled a bit of an upset in the presidential field with that uh, victory in Florida. And I was wondering, what are your thoughts on the current Republican presidential candidates? Do you believe that within that field there is the talent, the knowledge, and the uh, motivation to solve our problems? Well, yes, I think so. And uh, I think there's some good people, people of character and skill. Um, Again, what I'm waiting for, what I'm hoping for, and it's early, so there's plenty of time, is a, is a candidacy that will speak in the way I've tried to suggest uh, tonight, uh, that's willing to, again, bet on the, on the good sense of Americans and on their willingness to, to put the future ahead of the present and to, and to make, uh, shall we say, grown-up decisions, uh, to, to venture out and, and speak specifically. Um, doesn't have to be the answers that make most sense to me, but I'd like to hear, I'd like to hear a campaign like that. Um, because again, I'd like, to, I'd like to see somebody campaign to govern America, not just to win the election. And, and <laughs> Michael, should we get down to one more? Are we at the one more point, or how do you want to do this? One more. Uh, which mic? Shall I? Over here. 
Okay, my question is regarding the private school voucher program. Yes, ma'am. And my question is, is I want to know how that came about and also why is it that the parents that sacrifice to send their children to the school who are low income are not eligible for the vouchers because their children are already enrolled? Oh, oh I see. Well, how it came about, um, it was uh, uh, worked out with in the course of the legislative session, not exactly the bill as we put it in, but it, that rarely is the way those things work. The theory, of course, of this program is that um, people of low and modest income uh, should uh, have the same choice as the, those who are better off, who can move to a, a, school, a different school district if, uh, or uh, even use a non, pay for a non-government school. It is the um, biggest such program, the first universal uh, program in the country, and I think it's a matter of social justice that we, that we did that. I don't ever believe, I don't believe it will ever be a very large program in our state. I could be wrong, but my guess is 10 years from now, you'll still have 90% or something like it of Indiana kids in public schools. But in the lives of the children who do take advantage, I think, and, and as recently as this evening, <laughs> I got a big hug from an African-American lady who is thrilled about this program and what it will mean to, and what is meaning to some of, uh, of her friends uh, and neighbors. Um, so um, uh, I'm very glad we did it. I understand your question. There was no way financially to extend it retroactively uh, to uh, families who had made it, and I understand that point, but we could not find a way to do it practically. I don't have a better answer for you than that. I would remind everybody that the way the program was set up, the public schools get first chance. You're only eligible if you have, if the child has been in public school for at least a year. So a major motivation for wider choice and competition in education is to make the public schools better. You know, I'd be happy if the day came where no family in Indiana felt the need to seek out alternative education because the public school nearest them was so darn good. But we're not there now, and as uh, I, we were not prepared to, to say to low-income people, sorry about your luck. The better-off family next door may be able to make a different choice, but since you don't have enough money, you can't. Your child is... We're telling you, your child must go to that school and that school only. That was never fair. It was never the right thing for the children involved, and it's not the way to get a better overall public education system. I thank you so much for the privilege of this podium. Thank you.